966, the Eastern European Plain. For four years, a merchant and diplomat named Ibrahim ibn Yaqub has traveled all over Europe on behalf of his boss, Cordoban Foreign Minister Chastai ibn Shaprut. He's met Holy Roman Emperors and pagan Vikings, but now he has come to witness the creation of an entirely new country, the Duchy of Poland. Population, one million. Jewish population, zero. How did a land with no Jews during the Sephardic Golden Age become home to nearly a third of the world's Jews by the 1770s? Well, that took centuries, and we don't have time for it today. But here's how it got started. When Ibrahim ibn Yaqub had come to witness the establishment of Polish statehood, he was far from the first Jew to visit that land. Over the previous couple centuries, the Radanim had been a regular site on the steppe route between the Frankish realms and China. But it would still be a long time after Ibrahim's visit before any Jews actually settled there. What can I say? Poland was really far away. And since the collapse of the Tang Dynasty and the rise of the Rus, Jewish traders had stopped coming that way. By the end of the 11th century, there were known to be Jewish communities in Przemysl and the capital Gniezno, but we're still talking tiny numbers, probably fewer than 200. It was only after the First Crusade that the Jewish community of Poland grew to take on a more prominent role, not necessarily bigger, just more prominent. During the Rhineland massacres of 1096, a rogue priest named Folkmar led a massacre of the Jews of Prague, compelling many of the survivors to flee to Poland. While Poland's establishment in 966 had been conditioned on the adoption of Roman Catholicism as the official religion, the country remained mostly pagan for a few centuries, and without the deep-seated anti-Semitism imposed by generations of Roman rule and church teaching, Duke Bolesław III allowed Jews to own land and put them to work minting the country's coins. But Poland's rising fortunes also brought many of the old problems from the West. When Duke Bolesław the Chaste invited German settlers to establish their own laws in Polish cities, stripping Jews of their political and property rights was usually the first priority. So in 1264, Duke Bolesław the Pious issued the Statute of Kalisz, so-called because by this point most Jews in Poland were living in the town of Kalisz near the border with the Holy Roman Empire. Now, we don't actually have the original 1264 charter, just some later copies, so it isn't certain how much of what we have was in the original version. But basically, the statute ensured that Jews had all the same rights as Gentiles, that Gentiles would get the same punishment for committing crimes against Jews as they would against Christians, and that Jewish courts had full autonomy over both civil and criminal law. But while the statute of Kalish gets talked up a lot today, it didn't actually accomplish much in the short term. Control of Poland at this time was split between a bunch of rival dukes, of which Bolesław the Pious was just one, and not even the main one. And in that divided state, the Catholic Church was powerful enough that just two years later, an ecumenical council in Wrocław was able to declare the statute void and require Jews to wear the yellow cap and red badge, order them to hand over any of their property outside certain neighborhoods, and prohibit them from holding public office, selling goods to Christians, eating with Christians, being invited into Christian homes, or being seen in public during any Christian holiday, on the grounds that the Jews were supposedly plotting to murder all Christians. Now, for most of Northern Europe, that kind of insanity was already pretty normal, but it really pissed off the Polish dukes. Not only did these restrictions go against the national economic interest, they were just another way that foreign powers were meddling in a weak and divided Poland. Once the country was reunified as a full kingdom in 1320, King Władysław the Short got rid of all the local jurisdictions and established a single national code of law that made Jews equal citizens, removing all of the legal discriminations and even allowing Jews to dress like the nobility, which was unheard of even in Spain. But while Władysław's laws gave the Jews their freedom back, it was his son, Kazimierz the Great, who took things to the next level. Kazimierz was extremely distrustful of the church and the nobility and worried about their effect on the kingdom's stability. So he spent much of his reign implementing sweeping reforms to the Polish legal system, such as a separation of church and state, and the requirement that new laws have explicit written justifications rather than being arbitrary and capricious. Driven by this quest for rational lawmaking, Kazimierz believed that the laws protecting Jews were unenforceable so long as the Polish people were still taught to hate them. Okay, class, this here is a Jew, and he's the natural enemy of good Catholics like us. Every time you see one, make sure to- Hey, uh, lady? 
Could you get out of my house? Jesus Christ, it can talk. In 1334, Kazimierz expanded the statute of Kalish by imposing massive fines for shouting insults at synagogues and making it illegal to accuse Jews of making human sacrifices. He also believed that Jews would never be tolerated so long as their work was restricted to the inherently shady businesses of money lending, shipping, and law. So he allowed Jews to have whatever job they wanted. Hey, my name's Aaron Haparash. I'm a descendant of the elite hereditary cavalry of ancient Judea. Caring for horses is a cherished family tradition, passed down from father to son for over a thousand years, as our last remaining link to the soil of our ancestors. Can I join your army? Uh, I mean... I, I guess... Wow. Neato. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy that you signed up, because the last three dudes who enlisted this week have all died. I mean, the unit you're asking to join has a casualty rate of like 97%. Wait, what? Kazimierz probably hoped that instituting these protections would entice more Jews to move into the country. But that didn't happen. Even in 1334, Poland was still pretty far off the beaten path. And Jews living elsewhere didn't have much reason to leave their existing homes. At least not for a few years until a little thing called the Black Death. Originating in Central Asia, history's deadliest outbreak of bubonic plague arrived in Europe in 1347, when Mongol soldiers catapulted the bodies of plague victims into the Genoese colony of Kaffa in the Crimea. Carried by fleas who lived on the skin of rats, the Genoese brought the disease back to Italy, from which it spread throughout Europe, North Africa, and West Asia. Over the next three years, the Black Death killed between a third and half of Europe's population. But part of the reason it was so deadly was because of the cramped, unsanitary conditions most European Christians were living in. Muslim and Jewish communities, with their religious laws regarding personal and household cleanliness, usually fared better. Rabbis even used their positions as community leaders to institute new housekeeping rules to reduce the risk of infection. The Jewish death toll was still catastrophic by any modern standard, but not as catastrophic as for the Christians. And that just wouldn't do. By the end of 1348, Jews had been massacred in Toulon and Barcelona, accused of causing the plague by poisoning wells. But it was in the Holy Roman Empire where murder flourished. On Valentine's Day 1349, all 2,000 of Strasbourg's Jews were burned alive. The plague had not yet reached Strasbourg, but it was believed that killing the Jews would prevent it from arriving. By the same reasoning, the entire Jewish population of Erfurt was wiped out followed in the spring by Frankfurt, Mainz, Cologne, and Speyer. Upon the outbreak of plague, Pope Clement VI had issued two papal bulls condemning the blame or killing of Jews as being the work of the devil. It cannot be true that the Jews, by such a heinous crime, are the cause or occasion of the plague, because through many parts of the world, the same plague, by the hidden judgment of God, has afflicted and afflicts the Jews themselves, and many other races who have never lived alongside them. In this effort, he received medical testimony from his personal physician and offered the Jews his personal protection at his court, which had moved from Rome to Avignon. But his political rival, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV, actively promoted more violence against Jews by declaring that any property belonging to Jews killed in riots would be legally, officially free for the taking. Overall, 510 Jewish communities were erased from the Holy Roman Empire in 1249. Between the death toll from the massacres, those killed by the plague itself, and the flight of German Jews for greener pastures, especially Spain, the Jewish population of Northern Europe fell from over 20,000 to approximately 350 in less than two years. But here's an interesting fact. While the rest of Europe was being ravaged by the Black Death, Poland was also being ravaged by the Black Death. Yeah, you may have heard before that Poland somehow avoided the plague, and there are a ton of YouTube videos speculating about it as if it was fact, but this is actually an outdated bit of selection bias. Back in the 1960s, when there was a lot of new scholarship on the Black Death, there weren't many known primary sources from Poland, but absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. It was also thought at the time that Bohemia had escaped the plague, but more documents emerged proving otherwise, and in recent years more sophisticated environmental research has revealed the same about Poland. 
But even if you were just as likely to die from plague as a Jew in Poland, you were a lot less likely to be murdered over it. And by 1351, the majority of the Holy Roman Empire's Jews had crossed the border. In fact, more Jews fled to Poland during the Black Death than had already been living there, which resulted in a radical cultural shift. Throughout the Middle Ages, it was standard for Jews to speak the local language of their neighbors as their own, but with additional vocabulary from Hebrew and written in the Hebrew alphabet. In the case of the Holy Roman Empire, that language was what we now call Middle High German. But in the course of the mass exodus to Poland, these Jews took Middle High German with them. Within a generation, it had displaced Canaanic, or Judeo-Slavic, as the main language of the Jewish community there. And while the German spoken in Germany continued to evolve into what we know today, this German didn't. This was the birth of Yiddish. By the time of Kazimierz's death in 1370, Poland was still home to less than 1% of the world's Jewish population at that time. But those who had settled there had relative freedom and a new language that was at once uniquely Jewish and yet also intrinsically European. As the continent began its march into the modern era, the size and influence of this community would only grow. It had to. The light of Spain was flickering out. Special thanks to my patrons, including Jeremy Biskind, Ted Rossini, Corey Ard, Eric Atreides, Matthew Brotman, Lev Ham, Gary Davidson, Greg Maev, Vicky Nelson, Nave Tal, and Org Weiss.